of this is the color theory of this movie. Uh, Dark Fable is a very professional tool. I would say that uh, it's more similar to Da Vinci Resolve in the color space than it is light lightning. Um, so you have to know like the difference between um, between chroma, the saturation, the light, the chroma condition, and yada yada yada. Eventually, you can get some good results without being a turbo killer. Oh, so I just want to get some Appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Sorry. Wouldn't be a technical conference without technical problems. As long as the machine doesn't kernel panic, it's a win. So, um, <laughs> technology is difficult no matter what it is. Um, so you probably should kind of learn some color theory as you go, and you'll pick it up if you read through the documentation a little bit and watch some videos. Uh, the community. Well, I love them, but they're like most lost communities. They are not for the thin skin. Some of the developers can be prickly, to say the best. Um, it's uh, They're smart people, but you kind of have to approach them like they are the king of their mountain a little bit. Um, uh, there is a forum that I post on. And it's a mailing list that are a bit more user intro, user friendly. But um, it is definitely... Um, it is definitely a bit rough in places sometimes, like most lost communities. That's changing for the better. I, I, I don't enjoy being yelled at when I make a mistake. It doesn't help. So um, other people don't either. I don't think it's really a productive way to move forward. But it is what it is, and it's changing. Well, it's not is what it is, but it is changing. And a brief history here. Like I said, I like to know things about the thing that I'm thinking with my thing and my pictures here. Um, um, things. It's all things all the way down. So, it was originally released in April of 2009. Um, the first revisions <coughs> are very similar to Lightroom and ACR at approach. 2.6 version was, I think, the turning point. That's when the filmic and the scene referred approach uh, came out, and that has been like a game changer. That has been a huge differentiator between Darktable and Lightroom. Uh, 4.0 is just around the corner. Um, as with, again, other uh, all the Flox products, new forks and rewrites are also around the corner. There's a port of it to Vulcan. Um, there's a n one of the developers recently split it off and started a whole new thing, cutting out Legacy Cruft. And so, it, it, you know, typical stuff. What is Darktable not? And I wanted to up top on touch on this. As a member of this community and stuff, it is not free, gratis Adobe Lightroom. We get so many posts per week or month or whatever of like, hey, I downloaded Darktable. It doesn't exactly duplicate my Adobe Lightroom output. Why is that? What a piece of crap. Um, it's not. And I'll explain why. And I'll get into more of the bits and pieces here in a minute. But it is its own thing with its own methodology and its own approach to image editing. It is not just, you know, free Adobe Lightroom. I, I think people get... Um, entranced in this idea that hey I just need um, I just need Lightroom but I don't want to pay for it they, they think of free software as piracy in the same vein but um, no it's it's different than that and the reason why that works is I'm gonna do a quick five second spiel on how raw development works when you take a raw photo it's not a photo it's a bucket of bits it's just some data right represented there by some nice free artwork I found that was of binary Ooh, we're in the matrix or something. It's all a simulation. Anyway, so, um, and when you pass it through a raw processor, they do math. So this is all data. This is all numbers. These aren't mystical uh, creations brought down from on high, um, you know, and with incantations. These are just doing math. You know, when you adjust the brightness on an image, it's just, it's just adding some numbers together and putting out a result. All of these approach that differently. So you're going to get as indicated by having different colors and stuff on the other side, different results out of each of them. The middle one's raw therapy, by the way, if you're not familiar with that logo. Uh, it's another great free raw processor. I'm not as familiar with it. but um, So you're going to get different results, um, especially with Adobe stuff. You cannot, you know, Adobe's closed source. Boo. You cannot see inside their code to see what it's doing. We have no idea. It's like handing um, a chef all of the ingredients for a cake but no recipe and say, okay, You've got to duplicate that guy's cake without knowing how they did it, the guy or gal's cake without knowing how they did it. And then you get upset 
when the cake's not exactly the same. Every chef is a little different. Maybe they use two eggs. Maybe they use buttermilk instead of regular milk. Maybe they, it's just a little different. And that's the same analogy here. You're going to get different results. Um, uh, continue the analogy. Anybody here old enough to have shot film? It's, you know, like differing your developing process. Different chemical brands, uh, different times and different baths, everything. It's, this is the same, um, same smell uh, on, on the digital front. Um, and another thing I want to drop in here is a lot of people come in and they're like, well, you should be more like Adobe. Adobe is the right way, and Adobe is not canon, okay? It is an interpretation <laughs> of data. Um, Darktables is as correct as Adobe's. As Adobe's. Um, just because it doesn't look the same doesn't mean that it's not um, as relevant or as more meaningful. So uh, Adobe is not canon. Likewise, at your, can your camera, if you put it in JPEG mode, that's interpretation. So... Um, good. Everybody good on that? Understand that? Cool. Uh, just a couple more slides, then we'll get into, like, the live kind of, um, the live show. So, a note on scene referred versus display referred. You're probably used to the display referred workflow, um, which is where you transform into the, um, color space. You transform up here into your color space. Um, into your display's color space very early on before you do your adjustments. Uh, this is limiting, and this is what like Lightroom and a lot of image editors do. Um, they, uh, they, they take your linear data from your camera, they put some nonlinear math on it, you're losing brightness data, you're losing, um, not brightness data, exposure data, you're losing color data in that transformation, and you're limiting it to your display. Uh, we all know here, you know, technology changes, technology's advanced, HDR displays are on the front, on the horizon. Um, Darktable takes a scene-referred approach, where you do your grading and adjustments in the camera's color space, where you've got the most data available. You know, my, my, my digital cameras these days, 13, 14 stops. My 10-year-old D800 even was like 11 or 12 stops worth of light. Uh, you've got so much data there. So they stay close to the camera as long as you can. And then you do that transformation into the display space at the end. Um, and this is what Darktable does. And I think it's a little better. And again, say, you know, Linux eventually gets support for 10-bit HDR displays. And you go down to Amazon or Newegg and you pony up your money and you get one. Uh, Darktable's ready for that. You can adjust right for it. You know, Adobe, you're going to have to go back and do some more stuff or they're going to have to update their code. So it's a little bit more future-proof, I think. Uh, you get a little bit more better colors. It handles, um, you know, I said before, this is just math. You know, you subtract two numbers, you can get a negative number. Sometimes you get, like, negative color values or out-of-gamut values that don't make any sense if you go to the display space too soon. Um, whereas if you keep in the camera space where you have wider data ranges to work with, you can stay inside of a same data range longer. So uh, it has some advantages. It is, the disadvantages is, again, this is a steeper learning curve because you have to know a little bit about color stuff than the display referred to a little bit more typical user-friendly, I guess, mainly from the fact that we teach it in school mostly. So, All right. Uh, one word on organization. Darktable is a, um, is a uh, asset manager. Um, photos are just files. Treat them as such. That's what I do. I create a directory structure I can manage. I don't know if you can see it here. I'm going to step down here. Um, but, you know, I've got all of my photo directories organized into, uh, into like, um, sane ways by event or by client, portraits, um, editorial, wedding stuff, um, you know, by photos by year I have, uh, what the event is, and I collect my photos in there. Um, a lot of photo software by default just dumps, you know, day, month, year, you don't know what it is. Um, I do this because, and I preach this because all photo software dies eventually. I have changed raw processors three times. If you are bound to the way Lightroom organizes photos or Aperture for organized photos and you try to move to Darktable or, you know, Darktable ends up dying in a developer war, the great developer war of 2025, um, and you want to move to raw therapy or uh, Darktable the resurrection, whatever comes out after it, uh, you know, your files are still on your disk in a way that's sane to import them into another raw processor. Um, <coughs> renaming files with metadata seems redundant to me. 
Uh, I, I used to shoot, I shot professionally for a number of years. I worked with studios and stuff. And so like on my camera, I would change the naming scheme to put my initials in the name because I would hand the end of the shoot, end of the wedding, I'd grab my card and hand it to the main photographer or he'd hand it to me. I'd dump all the photos and that way I know who shot what and everything. Um, so I don't rename with metadata. There's metadata in the file. You can look at it in Darktable. You can manipulate it with uh, XF tool and everything on um, on the command line. Even sticking metadata into the file name seems silly to me. So that's just a word. I know a lot of people do it, but anyway. So further reading, Darktable docs. Um, this is the forum I was talking about. I discussed at pixels.us. It's a whole free open source open uh, photography community. They're great people. They do some uh, stuff. It's not just Darktable. They talk about raw therapy, GIMP, Natron, Caden Live. Uh, if you're using open source photography, even if you're one of those um, um, unwashed masses of Mac and Windows users, you know you can come there. Uh, the Windows devs hang around there too. So you can talk to the developers. You can meet people. Uh, you can ask questions. They have a thing called Play Raw where you can upload your raw photo, and people can um, and people can uh, you know. You know, you can say, hey, I edit it this way. What do you think? And then they try to edit it and get better. And, you know, so it, it helps you improve your skills, too. Um, I like that place a lot. And this is my website, onebutton.org. I occasionally make blog posts about Barktable. There's links to my YouTube's channel and all that stuff there. Um, and uh, I keep meaning to <laughs> update that thing, but I'm uh, sorely behind. Um, but those are some more resources for you to check out. I highly recommend those. Of course, I'm going to highly recommend myself. What egotistical maniac who gives a talk wouldn't? Anyway, uh, so live table, live demo. So, good, about 20 minutes. All right, timing this right. So we're not going to do too much theory. This is going to be a nort some nort norts nuts and bolts getting started kind of thing. So just to let you know. All right, so I'm going to stand behind the confuser now, and we're going to fire up dark table. So. I deliberately kind of set it back. Can everybody see that? Okay, I, I tested it on my stuff at home, but my screen's a little different. Um, I apologize. Uh, let me see if I can, um, if I do the display. Let's see. Maybe if I, if I do 200%, does that make it? Uh, you can see it, but you don't get any real estate out of that. Man, if GNOME only had fractional scaling. So. Wonder. Let's see. Tweak. If I can just do fonts, let's do like 1.5. Is that better? Yeah, I'm going to go 175 maybe. How's that looking? Good. Okay. Cool deal. All right. So this is your default um, brand new interface, or, you know, when you first install it, um, you come into the light table module, which is your organization point. This is where you import. This is where you rate. This is where you call. This is where all that happens. Um, down here in the up import side, you've got add the library and copy and import. Um, these are the two methods. You can either um, add the library in place, and this is the way I do it, or you can copy and import. So you can insert, ins insert? insert an SD card and um, actually bring in the images um, in Darktable's way. Like I guess I don't really do that, but you can. Um, I usually recommend doing a quick run through the preferences, and you can do that here with the gear icon. And that gives you your global preferences. A few things to check here. The, the, the defaults are usually pretty good. Um, Darktable runs well if you have an OpenCL enabled system, um, like I do here. Um, it can make use of NVIDIA CUDA or um, uh, AMD's ROCKM stuff. I, I have an AMD card in my desktop at the house. But that's, um, that's completely, uh, that's a, but make sure that's enabled because it will help speed it up. Um, a word on system requirements, uh, you know, you are doing, um, boy, it is struggling with the font scaling. Uh, you are, you are, uh, you are, doink, is it going to, come on. Fonts, it's 
go back to one. Okay, there we go. Now we'll just not minimize the window after we scale the fonts. Or we can just scale them to two. And that'll be happier. Actually, top bar, uh, the title bars, uh, maximize should already be there. Ah. All right. I don't know why it is freaking out over the uh, fonts. Actually, we can change that. That's a good example of what the check-in settings. So you can come in here and you can override um, your system's DPI if you need to. So if you go under general, um, GUI controls for text DPI, let's, let's double that. So what, 96, 168, something like that should do it. Uh, save and apply. There we go. Okay. Um, that's a little bit readable. Sorry, guys. Um, I guess when you pick out projectors for a Linux conference, you don't really think about color and things like that. It's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Is that better? Yep, cool. God, light mode. Why is this thing freaking out over the fonts? Anyway. This? Oh, no, no, it's not. Uh, it's GTK base. So, it is not liking that. Is it because I have it enabled here? It is, no, it is based on, G it is based on GTK, but it does use CSS for the style sheets. Um, let's try this once more. 150, 168. Okay. It 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 does um it uses uh CSS for the style sheets um but you can um it is not Electron no 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 it is written in C yeah uh, you cannot do um you cannot do uh fast image code in in I think it's just going off the screen there well that is an odd bug well we'll just have to live with the small font there we go. We'll restart it here. Okay. I guess there's a live stream of this, but um, sorry about the technological differences. Of course, m uh, extending the display also worked on my home setup, so I don't know why that's not working here, or on the one I tested this on. Uh, if I just do settings can I nope it does not like that at all okay all right well we'll get the show on the road you can watch the live stream my apologies um, for that so um, light theme anyway should help but you've got the import here um, and you can set a global import rating and stuff like that um, but this is not uh, so we'll go through the we'll go through the uh, settings here a little bit. Um, if you can read that, if, can I just add a little bit? Maybe I can do like 120. Sorry, I'm stuck on this product. There we go. Okay, is that a little better? Yep. I feel like if I go too big, it just complains. So all right, target table needs to be restarted. We'll restart it. Okay. So in the settings, um, you can disable a bunch of stuff. There's a ton of stuff here because it is 14, 13 years old now. Um, I usually just make sure your OpenCL is enabled if you have an OpenCL card. Um, I, the default is the scene referred workflow. You can change to a display referred workflow if you prefer. Um, you can also change to a modern um, per um, uh, chromatic, abduration, uh, chromatic adaptation defaults. There's two ways to apply light, uh, white balance and light and dark room or dark table. Sorry, I'm still flustered over that font bug. Um, but <coughs> it's uh, I just use the legacy and switch manually if I need to. Um, you can actually paint in different white balances on different parts of the image in the modern system. It's quite nice. So if you're in a hall like out there and you've got these 
gross fluorescent lights that make everyone look green. Uh, you can paint in just a white balance for that and then default the rest of the image to sunlight from the outside window. And it looks, you know, it helps with that. Um, the only other thing I really would change, and this is just the way that I work, um, is I would, yep, I'm going to move it over here. I would set the initial rating to zero. I'm a binary thinker, of course. I'm a computer person. So if I am um, liking an image and I want to develop it further, I give it five stars. If it's not, I give it zero stars. That's my process. Um, I don't have, I don't use two, three, four stars. So I just set the default to zero. They're all bad until, <laughs> until proven. Let me see if I can go up a little bit more on this font. I'm going to, that's bothering me. 140 apply CSS. And, and I'll restart it to see if it's happier. There we go. Okay, it just hadn't closed the other way. That's even better. Okay, so uh, down across the bottom, you know, you've got your usual usual rating tools. You've got your stars. You can do Lua scripting. Uh, if you're good at Lua scripting, you can do things for HDR merging and stuff like that. Um, there's all sorts of stuff in there. Uh, collections are your typical fare. You can do by folder, film roll, file name. Uh, you can actually uh, search down. You can do um, narrow down this search, and you can add a second rule. So if you want to look inside of a folder, and you point it at the folder, and then you can look for a specific tag in that folder. Uh, you can look for um, any other specific criteria, metadata. Um, I usually apply metadata on import, and since this is a Linux thing, I usually do uh, Creative Commons by uh, NCSA. You can apply your own stuff in there. I recommend doing that. If an image goes on the internet, at least you get some credit for it. I, I you know, I do s Creative Commons. I love it, but um, I like tagging it. Um, and tags, you know, you can tag things um, just like you would in any other image software. So we'll do like self 2022, uh, Lunix, um, uh, Darktable, Darktable presentation fail. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, you can tag it with events, you know, Paul's wedding, um, um, you know, Sam's, Samantha's recital, whatever, you know, give it tags that are descriptive and mean something to you. Don't go crazy with tagging is my advice. You know, if you tag everything with, like, pretty flower and you search for pretty flower, everything's pretty flower. So you need to make a few tags, I would say no more than two for an image, and, and import them uh, and, and apply them to that. Um, creator, publisher, you know, you can put your name here or a website or something like that just to have a good link back to your online presence if you want it. We're all seeking internet fame. Don't act like you're not. Um, and then we can come in here and import. So after you set that, you click import, add the library. And I've just got some selected um, selected folders here for my self-talk. I also have a set of grab in graduation shots I took the other day for a person we can look at later. So I just grabbed some photos from my library. So you go through all of that. You can click this eyeball up here, and it will show you and hide you the thumbnails. So if you are sorting through a card of images, um, and say you took 500 shots or something like that, or you're like me and you're like, I've got a 64 gig card, I'll clean this off next week. Uh, <laughs> and then you go to import the next shoot's photos and you're like, oh man, these are all mixed in and I can't tell from file names what's what. You can show your icons there and kind of just select those. Uh, I'm just gonna select them all, obviously. So then we click add to library, it loads them in. It does it pretty fast here because this is a nice, shiny, fast computer. Um, and this isn't that many images at home. I think I have I have a Threadripper computer and I have <laughs> a little brag there, uh, humble brag. And I have thousands of image and it handles it just fine. You definitely, when you get to that scale, you want some sort of OpenCL graphics card because it helps with rendering the thumbnails and stuff like that. Fun fact. Uh, Darktable beat Lightroom to OpenCL, so win. Um, excuse me, can you speak up? Uh, it's just flat file. It keeps a. It has a little SQ. If you look in the dot config folder in your home directory, or I've been talking to normal people too long. Uh, your doc config directory inside your home directory, uh, there is a SQL database in there that this is all stored in. But no, you cannot point it at that. I think some other solutions you can. Um, yes, you can. That's the one I was thinking of, yes. No. Darktable does have a nice feature, though. Uh, that actually brings up a good point. Um, 
where you can come here. Say you're like me and you've got a NAS at home um, and you want to store all of your photo uh, bl photos on your NAS and but you want to work on a certain set on the road, you've got your laptop with you, um, or you want to take your laptop to the couch and work out there. Probably shouldn't work on color critical stuff on your couch, but whatever. Um, you know, if you want to, or you just want to use the faster storage on your disk, you can point light uh, dark table to your NAS and directory on your NAS, and it can catalog it. And then you say, well, I want to work on these three. So you click on those three. And it's really not going to do anything for me here because I'm already on the local disk. But you can click this button here that that um, let's see if I can do. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Zoom. Oh, what is the shortcut for zoom? I think it's taking it. anyway. Well, you could do um, copy locally to um, your to your uh, local SSD. So I can click copy locally. And it puts a little, um, it creates a little uh, copy of this in your uh, .config directory. And you can see here on these images, they have that little page turn out of them now, that little triangle. That means they're local images. So now those are stored in my home directory. I can take them, I can work on them. And then, you know, you come in, you do your adjustments, yada, yada, yada. Um, <coughs> you go resync local back to the, uh, back to the remote and it resyncs it back to the remote. So I use that frequently. I keep all my folders on my NAS. Sometimes I want to work on my big old Threadripper machine, bragging again. And so I take that, copies it all to my SSD. You know, SSDs are kind of expensive compared to spinny disks still, so you can um, get a lot less, a lot more space for that. And then you can work on them there and then resync them back. Or, you know, if you've got a mobile workstation like this Dell here, you can yeah, sync them to your local SSD, work on them, and then sync them back to your NAS. It's a great feature. Um, but thank you, that pointed me to that feature. So I've just imported three or four images, well, seven images here to look at. So um, like, with, um, like with other things, like I said, you can move around with your keyboard, the other unnamed software. You can assign star ratings. So um, one, two, three, four on your keyboard will do that, um, five. <coughs> Excuse me, we'll give you five stars. So I'm a narcissist, so I think these are all five-star images, keepers. So I'm going to assign them all five stars. You can also give color labels. So like in my instance, all of my keepers from a shooter five stars, but if it's something I think is portfolio worthy, I'll give it a pink label or a fuchsia, I guess, and it'll put a, a fuchsia label on there. And I'll just go and do a couple of these and say, okay, those are ones. And then you can filter back on that later in your collections. Um, I like this system. Um, it works for me, but uh, you can go through and organize that. There are um, there is a zoomable light table kind of a mode here where you can move more around, more like a light table. I don't really use this much, um, but you can do that. You can also hit R to reject an image. R talk like a pirate. R, or you can hit the little X down here. So say you're like, ah, I don't like this one. We'll nuke it. Um, I don't like this one. We'll nuke it. And it automatically removes the star rating, grays out the image. And then um, and then you can view just your rejected and select those. I just hit Control A. And you can then delete your reject rejects if you want. I'm not going to here because I'm going to kind of edit these images. But um, you can go through and call in that manner, just like in every everything else. So we're going to go back. You can also just search by five star, three star, unstarred only, uh, sort by all sorts of other things, file name, uh, capture time, import time. Make sure the time on your camera is right. I'm going to go ahead and unreject these. And you just hit R again to unreject them, or hit the little X. There's the other one. There it is. So all right. Should seem kind of familiar. Everyone following me there on how, how the organization and stuff works? Great. All right. So I've got a, just a smattering of raw files that I've taken over the years. We'll start with an easy one. I live in a beautiful part of North Carolina, but I'm not much of a landscape photographer. Um, mountains don't write checks to pay for cameras, so I don't really do it much. I'm more of a people photographer. I'm, uh, this is my first Linux conference. I'm painfully introverted. Uh, I live, I'm secluded in the North Carolina mountains. I don't really come out and do this too much. So the camera gives me an excuse to talk to people. So I mainly take pictures of people. Not that way. Okay, guys, not, not, not the creepy way, but <laughs> you know what I mean. So. Um, this should look kind of familiar to your um, to your Lightroom kind of interface, but I think the the uh, 
resemblance is skin deep. You've got snapshots, so I'm going to go ahead and take a snapshot here. So this is the default import, and as you can see here, it by default, you've got to do some things. You've got to apply white balance. You've got to to do your filmic, which is your conversion to your display space. Um, you have got to do your demosaicing, your input color profile, your output. These are like the standard steps that you know you have to get to take a bucket of bits and make a picture on your screen. And so every image that you import will have those already applied by default. Free, yay. Um, free stuff, right? <laughs> but, you know, you look at this image and you're like, this guy's a photographer? That's not a very good image. I want to leave. Where's the free food? Anyway, um, so we're going to change that, though. First things first, um, you've, got your, you've got your modules over here broken down. You've got your quick um, kind of... Uh, editing modules here. So you've got Filmic, you've got Local Contrast, which is uh, like the Clarity Slider and Dark and Lightroom. Color Balance RGB, which is what you use to adjust value, like Vibrant, Saturation, and Chroma. You can do most everything from in here. Uh, rotate and Perspective, Lens Correction. We'll go ahead and apply some Lens Correction, apply some Denoising. Every RAW photo needs Denoising. I don't care if it's ISO negative 12, you need to denoise it. It's going to have a little bit uh, Dark Table has quite good denoising, and if you want to see the uh, steps it's taking or adjust them, you click this little uh, escape box here, and it takes you to the module inside inside the deeper interface, and you can see it's using a wavelets. Um, you can adjust the strength, and you say it's a little too much. We just need a, you know, this is a low ISO image. I was on a tripod. I just need a little, little bit. I don't need to go crazy. This isn't an astro image like that moonshot where we've got to go. It was at ISO like 3200. We got to go. We got to go for the beans on that one on denoising. So you can also double up the denoise. So I find it um, easy. You can I uh, find it helpful to apply one round of luminance denoise and then one round of color denoise. Um, so you can apply those separately in modules. That's part of the power of this. Uh, you can rotate and you can rotate your image. So you know you want to pretend you're in Australia. You can rotate it upside down if you really want to. Boy, I mean we're in Australia now. Dingoes and stuff. I don't know. What do they have down there? <laughs> but so that's your kind of your kind of base stuff that you can do right from here. So the first thing I'm going to do is bring up the exposure a little bit. But I'm going to mindfully look at my highlights here. And down across the bottom, you've got a few tools you can see. Um, you've got <coughs> you've got your focus peaking mode, which will tell you where your camera was focused. You've got your ISO 1260, uh, 1264 6 mode, which will uh, give you a, a color reference editing mode. The raw targeting, so this is the raw overexposure, this little checkerboard looking thing here. Um, and that tells you where the raw file itself is overexposed. If you ever used a camera and you took a picture of your best friend in the backlit sun and you look at the sky and it's just white, um, it's because the sensor became saturated and you need to. Um, yeah, you, you've lost data there. And as you can see here, just where the sun was coming up, that has happened. There is no raw data there for it to really work with. And you see that little checkerboard pattern. Um, if you want to look at the clipping indication for display purposes, so this is where you're displaying is clipping. So you can see there that it's losing some color information data um, for my display. That may be OK. Uh, depends on your target. If you're printing to an older printer or something, or if you're using an older display, um, and it will show clipping if you're just clipping one channel. So if you're just clipping the B channel, it'll still show clipping there. It doesn't have to be completely clipped. Um, it'll also show black for your, so let's rank, it'll show blue for well underexposed. I don't have anything. We can look at that in another image. But so that's your, that's like your blinkies on your back of your camera. So we're going to bring this up a little bit. And now we're going to go into Filmic. And Filmic, I always like to go into the full Filmic, so I'm going to do that. Filmic is where the magic happens. This is like an almost one-stop um, shop for, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of getting your stuff right. I like to come in here and, and exchange the uh, shadows and highlights values. And that's kind of old nomenclature. The way Filmic works and the way the logic works here is you see three kind of um, um, sliders here. You've got relative white exposure, relative black exposure, uh, and dynamic range scaling. So instead of scaling for, you know, bringing your blacks up and to make a chunkier kind of black looking image or bringing your highlights up like you would in other image editors to or bring your highlights down in order to try to recover highlights, this you spe specify a dynamic range and you say everything inside this range 
is displayed on my screen. So here we can adjust the you know this is this is what I mean by getting a lot of dynamic range out of your image. And then you can go into look tab here and you can shift your highlights and shadows to where you get more room. So like right now I want more room on the highlight side, so I'm going to shift and you can see what's happening with the curve there. Shift to where I get more rooms on the highlights. I don't really care if I clip that kind of black part there next to me. And I'll cut up my screen brightness a little bit there. Um, and so we're getting there. We're getting some detail in that in that area. Um, you can come into. Might need to bring up the exposure a little bit. You can also drag the histogram. That's a highly that's a hotly debated feature. I'm going to cut that off. I may not care about some clipping in there. Um, <coughs> so. Um, you can drag it up with your Instagram. You can also, um, to adjust that, use a tool called the Tone Equalizer. So, anybody here audio person, you should probably recognize this interface. Uh, this is an equalizer, just like an audio equalizer. Um, shadows on your left, highlights on your right. Um, you want to come in here and make sure that your mask, y that you know, you don't have any clipping, that your mask covers the whole thing. So if you drag this down, you notice how it's turning orange. And if you go back out here, it's got an exclamation point. That means that um, your shadows are over here on this graph. They're not in the uh, range of adjustability. So you need to use your um, uh, mask exposure compensation to bring that up so that the full, the all the beans are there. We want all the beans. And you get your histogram. So down here is shadows. Over here is highlights. So we want to bring this up. So you can just mouse. You can see I got a little target here, and it shows you where it is. I want to bring this up. So I just kind of use my scroll wheel, and I get some detail in there. And I kind of come here. I want to bring this down a little bit. And you start seeing some details come in. Uh, maybe too much. Uh, you can also manipulate it directly. So you can come in here and slide it up. I think there's a little bit more in there. Maybe bring this down here for a little bit. I like having that dark kind of for foreboding foreground. Looks like looks like some cinematic. Uh, speaking of which, we can go cropping. And you can search for a module. There's tons of modules in here. I forget where they are all the time. I, I forget things. Um, so you can come in here and search for crop. And there's your crop. So I'm going to come in here and change that aspect to, you can change it to any number of aspects. Uh, cinemascope. We'll go cinemascope. I'm taking cinematic here, right? And we'll crop that. Makes it a nice wide panoramic. So the reason why uh, I wanted to snapshot this is I want to show you kind of the where we got to. Um, so we come back out here to the quick settings. Uh, color balance RGB. If you're not a color nerd, you don't need to worry about what the rest of that module is doing. But you can come in here and you can add in your chroma. You can add in your saturation, really get it looking good. Uh, another thing you can do if you want to stylize, uh, all the kids I hear, you want to Instagram it, you can come under um, display and you can adjust your target black up. So this is for your display. So you can actually make give it that kind of faded Instagram look. I'm not sure how well that's showing up on your display there. But um, so you can come and do that. You could do all sorts of stylizing stuff. And so we've gone. Get some more light in there for the get some more in there for the thing. So we have gone. I'll take another snapshot from this to this with just a few edits. So we've gone from something that looks like, uh, eh, you know, we've gone from uh, something that looks like uh, do 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 this. Yeah, it's an okay, it's not an okay picture. It's a terrible picture to something that's actually presentable um, with a few clicks. You've got details in the clouds. You've got um, color in the sky and stuff. Um, once you get more adept at moving around in here, you can do this. So, any questions on that kind of approach on moving around where the modules are? Um, the modules are segmented by, um, these are your active modules, so if you just want to see what you've cut on, you go to the power icon. Um, technical modules, this is where stuff like your lens correction, filmic libs, crop, exposure, orientation, haze removal, chromatic aberration, all the technical stuff, the mosaic. You can actually, the nice thing about about this is you can change your demosaic algorithm. I found some things work better than others. The lens correction uses the lens fund DB back in, so you've got all sorts of profiles there to work with. You've got your color grading, so like I said, you can come in here and do all kinds of stuff. You can actually adjust the saturation on a per channel, on like a per 
luminance value basis. Um, don't let this scare you. Uh, I'm an idiot. So I use 10 modules, maybe, on a, on a heavily edited image. This thing can do a lot of stuff. It really is the Linux of photography. Um, you, you, they're, 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 you know, if you don't want to see a module, you can, um, you can cut it off, or you know, um, and and delete it. Um, but, you know, a lot of these I just don't know, you know, I don't really use. You don't need to. So, all right. So now let's look at. Um, hmm, we looked at the landscape. Let's look at this concert photo I took. Holy no, moly, that looks bad. So <laughs> this is a good example of uh, where film it kind of, where scene referred kind of gives you uh, results you're not expecting. So uh, by default, film uh, filmic and the scene referred kind of revert to like a default. It tries to median everything out to a midtone. So you're going to open it and it's going to look a little weird from the back from the back of your camera. But that's easy to kind of deal with. We'll come in here. Whoop. We'll go back down to exposure. We'll bring that in a little bit. And this is an interesting image. How many people have shot a blue LED and seen that? Yeah, that infamous blue out of gamut color. Um, Darktable handles that pretty well, I think. Um, there are ways. That's part of what you can do with the color. With the uh, color balance module, I can touch on that a little bit. So we brought the um, we brought that down. I'm going to adjust the rotation here a little bit. Lens correction. Um, just a little bit of stuff there. We're going to hit the filmic. The lens correction is a, I guess I don't have my profile loaded for this lens. Um, so the lens correction, what are you talking about? So, see this blue? Oop. Yep. Yep. Um, so that's got on the, on the rafters, or uh, sound equipment, I don't know what that's called technically, but blue LEDs usually lay outside. Uh, I hate them for numerous reasons, but they ruin pictures uh, because they usually lay outside like what your camera can do. Uh, your camera can detect them, but your display can't display them because they're usually outside the gamut. You know, the color gamut is like a 3D space of color, right? And so y your color has to exist in that set of coordinates. And if it doesn't, it looks funny. And that's kind of, you can actually shift those a little bit to get them in. Um, you may get to that. We're getting a little low on time here. But um, you can see here we've got some, it, uh, we've got some overexposed in the lights and stuff like that. Um, we can lens up. I don't have a thing loaded, um, but you can adjust that down. You can come into color calibration. So this is the new white balance method. Um, and so the way you use this is you go and set your white balance to that D65, and then you do. Um, I usually use Cat 16 as a starting point. And color adaptive transform. You know your white balance just gives you like a. Uh, you know, it just cares that you get a good-looking neutral white or gray. Color adaptive transform actually kind of does a um, um, color, uh, like what your eye does. It does like a color, a neutral kind of uh, color calibration stuff. Um, and you can come in here, and you can actually kind of turn down the blue a little bit. So we can come in here. This is a good challenge. But um, mess with that colorfulness. You can bring that down a little. And that blue is starting to look a bit more natural and then but and then you notice that things start to look kind of weird in the whole image though right right here's where the power comes you go in here you say make me a new module you come in here and you say i want to mask this and i'm just going to do a rough mask please do not judge my masking ability based on this and you just come in here and you just paint in a little bit and you paint in a little bit more and then, colorfulness. You kind of pull that blue down a little bit um, and try to get it looking a bit more sane. Yeah. So it's not so uh, garish to the eye. And so you can paint in using this. Like, I can come in here and do another color adaptive transform. And... And double cat applied, but it's masked. That's okay. You can come in here and you can do different white balance for just that section. So you see that section is changing in white balance. So if you have, if you have a scene with two color sources, you can do that. I'm just going to do bypass because I don't need it. But 
Um, you can do that. Uh, double double white balance that way and get. Ah, I'm fumbling with my interface here, um, and you can get different see different parts of the scene kind of looking um, kind of uh <coughs> kind of looking better. So I'm gonna come in here and did I? There we go. So anyway, that's kind of how you can paint in some some c different color balance. Um, we'll end on um. Um, I guess I can end on some questions if anybody has any. I thought we would have more. Thought I would have more time to fill with image editing. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Years. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, and that's the same case here. I'm still learning. I'm. I'm. Like I said, I'm an idiot. <laughs> so I. I. I'm still learning stuff. Oh yeah, when I started this, like I was one of the first people making YouTube videos and tutorials on this stuff. Now there are um, probably uh, Bruce Williams on YouTube. Um, Aurelian, I, I don't speak French. Uh, I speak some Japanese and Spanish, but not French. Aurelian, P Aurelian Pierre, he's one of the developers. He makes some videos. I make some videos. Um, I'm trying to think. There's a couple others. Shane Milton, I think, is another name. Um, if you Google those guys, they have tutorials um, on how to use this. But yeah, it's yep, yep, and so it's it's always constantly changing. It takes a little bit of time. You'll get used to it. Um, um, but yeah, it, it does have a steep learning curve, especially if you're coming. It the the thing for Vim is very much like if you've ever remember the first time you opened VI when for me it was the late 90s and you tried typing something and it wasn't happening on the screen and you're like banging on the keyboard and you eventually find the I key and you're like, oh, oh, okay, that's the way this works. You come from Lightroom with the expectations that you're going to do things in a certain order and you try to do those and you fall flat on your face. Here, you've got to bring, you know, you, you're going to get used to a different order and how things work and that's where the Vim thing comes in. Um, any other questions? You, back there, yes. I have not, I've used, downloaded some. I am looking into the future for myself. It's pretty robust. I've downloaded some others that people have written. I, I purposely kind of came in here with a n fresh dark table so you guys could see, like, you know, I've got a few at home that I've downloaded. Um, uh, if you go to pixels.us, there's some forum posts there about that and stuff. But yeah, that's something I'm looking into in the future. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm an old C coder, so I, I'm used to assembly and stuff. So Pyth I do a little Python here and there, but um, yeah, yeah. So, but there's all kinds of stuff out there for that. Any more questions? Red hat in the back. Actual red hat, red hat. A time snapshots feature. That I do not know. I that uses the G Photo 2 capture back end. So whatever that ends up supporting, uh, this will too, probably. So for that, for that, the, the yeah, the, the tethering does that by I def by default. I I've only used tethering kind of a time or two out of curiosity. You know, cameras these days have big screens. You can get those video monitors for the HDMI, and those are just so much easier. So, um, any other questions? I guess for, I don't want to overstay my welcome. Everybody learn anything? Everybody terribly confused? <laughs> so, good. Thank you very much for attending, and uh, please, please ask questions if you want. Sorry for the technical problems. I was I tested this on. We have projectors on campus, and I was like, "Oh, this looks fine." And then, but we have different ones here.